is Constance from Mysterious Galaxy. I am very, very excited because tonight we are here with Liz Braswell and Britt. Britt, I don't want to mispronounce your last name. I'm sorry. I forgot to ask. Will you help me out? Rubiano, no problem. Thank you, Rubiano. And we are here to celebrate the new book on birthday. Yay, I'm giving a round of applause even though you cannot see it here. Hopefully you can hear it. But before I disappear and let them begin the amazing discussion about this book, um, just a couple reminders for everybody. If you would like to purchase the book, there will be a buy button I will activate that will pop up and you can hit that will take you directly to purchasing the book. And also, if you have any questions, there is a beautiful button down below that literally says ask a question and as the name would imply that is where you can ask questions for the author and anything you would like to know bring on the questions because we love questions and they're just always fun to get to hear but with that i will let them take it away and tell you about on birthday yay thank you constance my name is Britt rubiano i'm an editor at disney I actually went to college and lived in San Diego for many years, so it's a real treat to do this at Mysterious Galaxy, and hopefully we can do it in person one day. But I'm very happy to be joined by the New York Times bestselling author of such books as the Nine Lives, the Chloe King series, Stuffed, and of course the Twisted Tales, which we're here to talk about today. She's also my dear friend, Liz Braswell. Hi, Liz. Hi, Britt. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I've been thinking about this. We've worked together for a really long time and we've done panels individually about Twisted Tales, but never together. Never together. So this is pretty fun. Um, and I hope you'll humor me by answering some of the questions I have. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, well, I'm very curious to get your take. Ah, Alice pun already. Um, but first, can you give us a quick summary of Unbirthday for folks who don't know what it's about yet? So um, it is a number of years after um, Alice goes to um, Wonderland or thinks that she dreamed she did. And um, she receives a mysterious cry for help from her old friends in Wonderland and realizes that it was all real. It wasn't a dream. And she needs to go back to Wonderland to help save her friends and all of Wonderland from uh, the Queen of Hearts. Um, so that's the twist. It's like years later and she's going back as a, what would have been considered an adult in Victorian times, um, 11 years later. Yeah. So these books reimagine stories that have been around for a long time, mostly fairy tales, but of course, Peter Pan and Alice too. Uh, and not only that, they twist the Disney version specifically of these books. So sort of another layer, uh, an inception type of retelling, a reimagining of a reimagining. What's exciting to you about reimagining the Disney versions of these stories? And what are the challenges of doing that? Well, the thing uh, about Disney is um, all of their classic movies have contributed to what was up to this point an oral or recently written down tradition of fairy tales and folk tales and disney is like the modern equivalent of changing these tales and and telling them to more people so by twisting these tales i am sort of inserting my own uh look at these universes and these stories um and sort of changing the communication that way a little bit um, and becoming part of this this larger larger thing. As I've often said, um, if you look around at any version of uh, or retelling of The Little Mermaid, um, although technically not a, not a folktale because it was written straight up by Hans Christian Andersen, um, most versions you will find, uh, even non-Disney versions, the mermaid has the, uh, the the main mermaid has red hair, um, which was never specified, I believe, in the original um, story. But now, because uh, Disney has contributed to this this mythology of the Little Mermaid that she has red hair, almost every time you you see a telling of it, she's got red hair now. And so, my twist on that twist is is 
no more than storytellers have been doing for generations. Um, and it's exciting to uh, reach an audience as wide as fans of Disney are. Yeah, it's so true. For a lot of people, it seems the Disney versions are the definitive versions, right? Of those yeah. stories of the ones they grew up with and have a nostalgic attachment to. Exactly. So, yeah, it's fun to play in those worlds, I'm sure. And also- Oh, it is so it's, much fun. It's such a dream yeah. to being able to play in that universe in that sandbox. Right, yeah, so cool. So you've written six Twisted Tales so far. On birthday is the 10th book in the series. Do you have a favorite that you've worked oh. on? The favorite series moment? I know, it's like a parent. <laughs> Choose your favorite child. <laughs> it is. Um, well, I like a lot of different ones for different reasons, which I realize is kind of oh, not a that's not a solid answer. But um, personally, my favorite um, is Once Upon a Dream, because in it uh, I took the uh, Sleeping Beauty movie, and um, Aurora's character is um, she's a Princess who falls asleep, not the most fleshed out heroine of all of Disney's many movies. And I really enjoyed using that story as a metaphor for a lot of what uh, teenage girls go through when they're coming of age and sometimes withdrawing from the world, um, experiencing kind of um, some kind of like a quiet depression. Um, and I love the, the way I could take that book and and use it to tell this story. Um, I really enjoyed um, Tales of the Time, of the Time, because um, it was a murder mystery kind of, and I have never written a mystery before, and it, I had to do all sorts of like research on how to write a murder mystery, and uh, you know, set. There was also a, a time thing where like we went back in time to what happened before to what happens now as they're solving it, um, and that was very hard but very fun, and um, I learned a lot. From a, from a running standpoint from that book. Um, part of your world was just huge because uh, I was starting college, just in college when The Little Mermaid first came out and I was a huge Disney fan. And um, this was like a, a, a reawakening of the whole, the whole mm -hmm. Disney brand. Um, it was the first really well animated um movie that had been done by them in years especially uh, i was when i was a little kid i want well actually even a teenager i wanted to be a disney animator and that scene like under the sea was like this one of the animated scenes with the most number of hand-drawn separately moving characters in it um so being able to write the twisted tale of that book was uh i you know when at the time when it came out i couldn't have imagined i would have had such a job so it was, it's fantastic yeah. so they're all great and on birthday i mean it's alice in wonderland mm -hmm. she's she's alice like you don't get more amazing and literary and fantastic and yeah i mean that's a whole that's a whole another level of great and the the movie was so i don't like psychedelic with the pop colors and the really interesting imagining of the mom rats and the various creatures from uh, Wonderland, which I think were, um, well, not exactly what Lewis Carroll uh, described, was a perfectly, it, it made sense as a, uh, a, a visual representation of the craziness of Wonderland. So yeah, I can't pick a favorite, sorry. <laughs> I know. I say the same thing. People ask me and I say, they're all so different. They all sort of tiptoe into different genres, like you mentioned, with um, As Old as Time being sort of the mystery and Whole New World being the dystopia. Part of your... No, oh, did we get somebody joining? She uh, she popped up for a second, like a ghost in the machine, but she disappeared again. Sorry, it was accidentally me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we thought you were joining us. <laughs> Oh, very twisty, very on brand for us. That's great. Um, yeah, it's just, I think every time a new manuscript comes in, it's exciting and it's my favorite. So it's hard to pick one. Um, but actually what you were just talking about with Alice is a good segue to my next round of questions, which are all about Alice. So Alice in Wonderland is sort of perennial character and world. There's so much fascination with this story that never seems to go away. Why do you think that is? What makes Alice in Wonderland so compelling all these years later? Um, well, for one thing, 
I think this is true for me. I don't know if it's true for everyone, but uh, I could see it being true without really people realizing that they're thinking this is the character of Alice um, is a very honestly written character. She says things I have absolutely no problem imagining a little girl or a little boy saying, um, you know, despite all the Victorian mannerisms and politeness and etiquette she was taught, uh, she straight up says what she's thinking of or like what's on her mind just the way a little kid will. And, um, you know, there's a lot of today, uh, not even just today, but like 20, 30 years ago, when, when you, when you write a book, you, 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 you want, you want kids to act a certain way. Um, but there's something just so raw and real about the way Alice acts. Um, I think she represents the whimsical part of uh, all of us inside of us. So I think that's, that's a lot of it. Um, everyone sees a little bit of Alice in them. And then also the world of Wonderland. Uh, there's literally nothing else out there like that. And people have tried to sort of capture it since then. Um, I hope I have done an okay job, but it's it was the first book of its kind like that. And um, it's it's it stands alone as being one of the one of the first really fantastic pieces of uh, literature like that. That's so so I think I think the character of Alice and and the world that exists and the wordplay, which is absolutely fun. There's something in Alice in Wonderland for everyone. Yeah, yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot and I feel like to some extent, Alice sort of represents any fantasy or sci-fi fan or, or just a reader who wants to get immersed in another world, the good, the bad, the in between and just fall down that rabbit hole and, and be there a while. Yeah. Um, which you've done an amazing job, I'll say. <laughs> oh, capturing thanks. Spirit. And speaking of which, there's so many wonderful Wonderland locations and neighborhoods in this book. Some of them are ones we're familiar with from the film or from the Carol books, like White, the White Rabbit's house or the Queen of Hearts' castle. But there are so many fun new places in this book too, like the Queen of Clubs is around and the Bird Village and the Tavern. Where would you want to visit if you fell down the rabbit hole? Hmm. Well, I, I did always like the way, well, this is looking class, but I like the way she, um, she, she winds up in a reverse version of her own house where everything's a little bit off. And so that made it into unbirthday, even though it's not technically in Wonderland. Um, just little things like pictures of people moving in the background. Um, I um, I like the name play with the grunt around, which hopefully this isn't spoiling anything, but it's one of the places the characters travel to in my book. Uh, it's called the grunt around because that's you know when you've lost something or you you grunder around for it, whatever. Uh, it is uh, essentially a, a, a hidden tavern um, or a meeting place for the rebellion against the uh, Queen of Hearts. Um, yeah, and then there's the, there's, I have the Queen of Clubs, I've been to the Queen of Clubs, and she's got this fantastic, really odd castle that um, there's a couple homages to Escher and Labyrinth and a few other things going on in there. Um, I don't know. I'd like to visit all of them, except for, I don't think I'd want to visit the Forest of Forgetting. That place I've always found kind of scary, which is why I had to put it in the book. Yeah, yeah, that is a terrifying moment. In what story. about you? What place would you want to visit? You know, I love the Queen of Clubs so much and her castle and her little owl companion. And I'm curious about the people or the creatures that work for her. So I think I'd want to be there. Although to get there, at least the way Alice goes in our book, uh, you have to go through a game of chutes and ladders, which seems terrifying. So maybe if there's a, a back passage <laughs> to her. Fair club, enough. Yeah. Um, all right. So, in this book, as you mentioned, Alice is a bit older. She's a young woman, and she has a love interest in this book, which is a bit new and exciting and a bit different for an Alice retelling. Uh, what went into creating the character of Mr. Katz, Esquire, and that arc for Alice? Um, well, if I told the story correctly, which is backwards, which is correct for Wonderland. Um, it would Perfect. spoil some of the ending of the book, so I'm not going to do that. But the inspiration for the 
character of cats came from Wonderland itself, came from a character in Wonderland itself, which you find out about at the end of the book. Um, and then it's, um, I said in, in, in an interview uh, recently, um, Alice is from Victorian uh, London, which uh, is a very specific time, a very specific place with very specific people in it. Um, but Disney fans and Alice Wonderland fans um, are incredibly diverse. And um, it, I wanted to introduce some characters that were not what you would necessarily expect to be in uh, just a very Victorian English place. So um, I made him a, a child of Jewish immigrants. Um, he's Russian, uh, he's a lawyer, um, but he's a lawyer who is um, not beaten down by the system yet. Um, and has still a little quirky. I've actually received two fan mails already from lawyers who've read the book, or actually one was a fan, one was a fan mail, one was a review, who were so delighted that there was a lawyer character in it who was funny and quirky and good looking. And um, <laughs> a love interest, they're like, this is so nice. Like one of them was an English, uh, was a barrister. And he was like, it's so nice to read a nice thing about lawyers. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Good representation. So, and Alice needs someone who can challenge her. She needs someone who's um, smart and funny and clever and someone who respects her own whimsy and her own goals and desires. So that and a certain Wonderland character is what inspired Cats. Yeah, I've told you this before, but Cats is one of my favorite characters that you Yay. created. He's so clever. And I think what's so compelling about him is he's so open to things, which you really want in a Wonderland story when all of this wild stuff is happening around you. You want someone who's open to it and taking it in and not closing themselves off from it. Um, and that's what I like about him. Yeah. Which actually, digging a bit deeper into that question, you've got a lot of amazing characters in this book, some from the original film or stories with a new lens on them, like the White Rabbit and Hatter, some that we see briefly or just mentioned briefly in the film, like Alice's sister, Matilda, or Marianne. And then we've got completely new characters, and Vivian, another one of my favorite characters of all time, Alice's eccentric aunt who teaches her photography. Um, we also have the Queen of Clubs, like we mentioned, and Cats, the Knave. What do you prefer? Do you prefer creating new characters whole cloth for these worlds or seeing the old ones in a new light? Um, creating a new character from scratch is easier, which uh, which sounds like, like kind of a terrible answer, but straight up, that's, yeah. that's true. Um, one of the hardest but most rewarding things about writing the Twisted Tales is taking characters that have been defined a certain way in a movie and that everyone knows and loves a certain way and not changing them a lot or at all, but going in, creating more of a depth of emotion, of character development, of uh, intellect, of whatever, but without them being too different from the characters we all know and love. So, um, I guess that's not exactly the answer you're looking for. I I really do enjoy, especially with Alice in Wonderland, I, I enjoyed creating characters that I thought would fit into the universe of Alice in Wonderland. Um, writing Alice was uh, extremely hard um, mm. because I both have the Disney Alice um, and the original Alice and she speaks and talks a certain way. And um, it's funny, I've, I, some of the mail I've gotten about it, people are like, you've got her dead on. And other people are like, she's a little childish. I'm like, mm, she's a Victorian woman still living with her family. She's not going to be exactly like the way you or I might have been at like the same age. Um, so that, that's hard, but uh, they're both, each developing characters or creating characters are both rewarding in their own way. Yeah, that's so true. I know that certain characters as we worked on the books together have posed those challenges. Belle in particular was one that was super challenging. And I think for me especially, Belle is one of my favorite characters and she has to have flaws for her to be interesting. But every time there was a flaw, I'd be like, no, but it's Belle, she's perfect. <laughs> I remember that very clearly. Right? <laughs> yes. 
So yeah, it's such an interesting challenge to make sure that these characters do feel like three-dimensional, fully realized, and while we're throwing a wrench into the system and throwing new situations at them, that they're growing and evolving in an organic way, which you do just a fantastic job at. Thank you. Belle was also a special challenge because she is smart and she is learned, but in the movie, often you, she's either saying something sort of funny above Gaston's head, or she's mm-hmm. not saying exactly what she feels. You're supposed to you're supposed to deduce it from like the way she acts, the way she moves, whether she whether she touches her hair. So uh, right. she was actually harder than a lot of the other heroines. Yeah, that's so interesting. Do you have any favorite series moments, sort of? moments that stand out to you working on the books? <sighs> hmm. um, uh, well, I mean, different moments. Um, so the way the, the for, for people out there who, who might not know how books get done, um, I, uh, they, they take about a year from these twisted tales take about a year from start to finish. And um, except for this year, because of the schedule being slightly off, I have always spent the last two weeks of August uh, (laughs) finishing up, no, no, I'm sorry, finishing up a twisted tale um, while, um, while we, as a family, we take our yearly two week vacation in Cape Cod. So um, usually I spend like one week, the kids go to camp and my husband and I are working um, and I'm trying to finish it up. And then the second week is hopefully I've got done by then and I'm on vacation. But um, the year that I was writing um, Part of Your World and it was A Little Mermaid and I was in Cape Cod and the weather mm-hmm. was gorgeous. And while I, I mean, while I was writing or whatever, I had like little piles of beach stones on my desk. Mm-hmm. Um, it, that, was, that was fantastic. Um, yeah, that was one of my, my favorite like moments. Um, what else? Uh, I like the fact that, um, so Britt and I give each other little themed gifts at the end of each book when it's done, um, become kind of a thing with us. So I like trying to figure out what I'm gonna get her at the end of each project. No, I like it's that a too. creative change every time. <laughs> it is, <laughs> it is. Um, so that's fun. Yeah, I I'm, I I really enjoyed our um over the pandemic that our sort of we you know the our work emails and like our pen pal emails where we just catch each other on life because yeah. I was hermetic as a writer before but now <laughs> I really don't see anyone. So true. We need those those emails for sure to just check in and yeah see how each other's doing. It's funny. One of my favorite series moments has to do with part of your world too. I don't know if you remember this, but. A few years back, I had a trip to New York for work and I had a free day. So you and I used the whole day to start potting out part of your world. And we went from cafe to restaurant to bookshop to bar probably at the end of the day. Yeah, (laughs) And it's all fabulous because you know the best spots in New York. But we're just eating and talking and being like, all right, so Ariel didn't defeat Ursula. So she hasn't gotten her voice yet. Where is she going to get her voice? And what's Ursula doing as Vanessa on land? I'm sure everyone around us was like, what are they talking about? That was a fun day. I do remember. Was that, was that, did we go to MoMA that day too? Or was that a different time? I think we did go that day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah we've had so many I fun. So. I know. And then, twisted excursions. Yeah. That That's was so nice. Great. Yeah. We don't get to do things person in person much because uh, mm-hmm. for everyone watching at home, Brit's on the west coast and i'm how are things going over there by the way you've got family uh yeah it's pretty smoky um all the fires but we're we're staying inside and hoping they can contain them soon (sighs) um my last question for you before we open it up to the general q a is is there a non-disney story you'd ever want to twist hmm Okay, well, my first book I ever published was a retelling of the original Snow White, mm-hmm. um, the non-Disney version. Um, so there's that. This, okay, this is this is weird. This is not. This is a, a story that like I've always wanted to do. I, I, at least as a kid, I haven't revisited it in a while. 
not sure would work in this day and age. Um, but one of my favorite Grimm's fairy tales was the goose girl, the little goose, goose yes. girl. Um, I had pet geese when I was growing up um, and the gander would actually come and meet me at my bus stop uh, when I got home from school and walk me oh. home. Uh, it was like a dog almost. Uh, anyway, so I have always wanted to redo the goose girl, but make the princess a little less dumb is what I would really like to do. The, <laughs> that, that princess is just like, wow, she's something else. Anyway, and there's a talking horse head and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's the one I would like to twist. That's what about my you? favorite. If you could edit any or or write, because I know you write a little, what what would you do? I do. You know, I've been trying to think about this. Um, I keep coming up with Christmas and holiday stories, and I think mm. it's just the pandemic <laughs> making me want to retreat into something more jolly. But I, I don't know. I'm curious about a, a Mrs. Claus origin story. Or oh yeah. Um. Yeah, but I, again, I think it's just me wanting to escape too. <laughs> Something yeah. a bit more scary. Um, okay. All right. Well, let's open it up to the general Q and A. It looks like we've got some questions in here. All right. First question is, what was the hardest part to write about this book, and which scene brought you the most joy? Um, the hardest part was getting Alice's voice right. Uh, no, not so much her voice as her trying to predict what she would be like as an older person. Um, that was definitely the hardest part. Um, and okay, the thing which brought me the most joy, uh, it was, <laughs> it was, of course, one of the most self-indulgent uh, scenes, um, which you very correctly helped me cut down. Um, but it was just when nothing was happening. The the Mad Hatter and Alice and the Dormouse um, and the Dodo are floating in an umbrella uh, and having a, a poetry mm -hmm. contest, like often mm -hmm. happens in Alice in Wonderland. They reach for something poetry, um, mm -hmm. only it's 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 Wonderland, so it's actually terrible doggerel. It doesn't make any sense. But um, I really enjoyed that. I, yeah, I love what you've done with Alice because she does feel sort of ties into what we were talking about before, but it does feel like she's very true to the original character, but she's got some growth. Like she knows that she puts her foot in her mouth sometimes and she still does it, but she's trying. She's sort of learning, you know, yes. as, as the years have passed. And she's, she's clever. She's smart she's curious you know and she's also a little vain and unapologetically so which i, I love about her too um yeah you well i mean her, her golden it. her golden hair is like that's like so, so part of alice it's part of alice it's iconic that's true all right the next question here is who is your favorite side character to write oh that's a good one um well, the Mad Hatter has always been my favorite character um, in the like the Disney movie. Um, I'm not, oh, he's almost a main character, really, though. Uh, Cheshire Cat was fun to write. Mm. Um, mm, so in in this world, uh, in this version of Alice, there are each of us has a twin in the Wonderland world of Wonderland. Um, and so the Mad Hatter's twin is, uh, he's also a Hatter, but he's a crazy white haired socialist with perhaps a Vermont accent. Um, he was he was very fun to write. <laughs> um, yeah, and Aunt Vivian, Aunt Vivian was fun to write too. So those yeah. are all the, all, the, all the extroverted over the top characters were fun to write. <laughs> no, um, I stand Aunt Vivian, she's the best. Out of all the books you've written, which is your absolute favorite? So maybe not Twisted Tales, but, or not just Twisted Tales, but your whole body of work, which you have quite a few. Um, uh, again, it's like picking a child. And as oh. I constantly tell both my kids, um, <laughs> I would never do that. Uh, I can't do, I really can't do that. Um, I really love Once Upon a Dream. Um, 
I like Snow because it was the first book I got published, even if I, I think I've improved as a writer since then. Um, and I really like uh, Stuffed, this mid-grade book, which uh, I, I published last year, which is about how monsters are real and your stuffed animals protect you from them at night. Um, hmm, part of your world, I like too. I, I can't choose. I can't choose a favorite book. No, they're all great. Um, Once Upon a Dream is one of my favorites too. Uh, twist is what the Sleeping Beauty never woke up. Aurora has to fight Maleficent in her dreams, and gosh, the journey that she takes, both physically and metaphorically. Chef's kiss, Liz. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All righty, next question is, why did you choose photography as the key to bringing Alice back into the world of Wonderland? I'm super interested in the use of photography and literature, so I find this to be very interesting. Oh, good question. Um, well, there's a bunch of different reasons. Uh, first of all, Charles Dodgson, um, Lewis Carroll, was a hobbyist photographer. Some of it was problematic, admittedly, but that was part of who he was, and um, I thought it was a nice homage um, to him. Uh, but also, uh, I wanted Alice to have a creative outlet that also allowed her to try and recapture Wonderland. Like, even though she didn't think it was real after a number of years, she still wanted to find pieces of it in um, in our world. And it's also very, it's a very Wonderlandy contraption, uh, especially the sort of camera she would have been using, which was mm. kind of like a, an early uh, brownie box. Um, there's like, there's, there's like lenses, there's glass, there's, uh, you're projecting an image. Um, it's the reverse on, on the film side. It just feels very, very Wonderland or through the looking glass to me. And um, it would have been, an appropriate hobby for her to have had that would have not been just like painting or something else like at that time something interesting new yeah and shout out to our amazing cover artist and designer for putting an image of what camera alice uses on the cover of unbirthday it's modeled after the exact camera that's mentioned so Huzzah! Yay. fun little easter egg there <laughs> All right, next question. Are there any more Twisted Tales in the works? Ooh. Perhaps. Perhaps, yeah, that's a good, we'll stick with that, perhaps. Perhaps, 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 as the song goes. Mm -hmm. um, what is something you love about the original Alice tale that isn't commonly known? Um, the deer that she walked with in the Forest of Forgetting was probably inspired by a f herd of these little tiny deer. I forget what, what they are. They're like a subspecies of deer um, that's in one of the parks at Oxford. So wow. there's one. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's a good uh, one. I was, I was an Alice maniac and um, a friend of mine uh, spent her semester abroad at Oxford and um, the entire weekend I spent with her, um, I dragged us to every single Alice in Wonderland related spot. And I saw the deer and I was like, ha, check, done. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's that's something. That's amazing. That is a must see pilgrimage, right? For any Alice fan, you have to go oh, to yeah. Alice. There's, a, there's also a story, I don't, I don't know if it's, you know, I should have looked this up. I don't know if it's real or a modern urban myth, but uh, apparently the story goes that Queen Victoria liked Alice in Wonderland so much that she uh, asked Charles Dodgson to send her his next book. Um, and he's a mathematician. So the next book he had published was mathematics. So he sent that to her. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. I wonder what she did with that mathematics book. <laughs> <laughs> no. Incredible. All right, next question. Do you have, oh, this is great. Do you have a favorite Alice adaptation besides your own? Um, I really liked the video game, uh, American McGee's Alice, okay. honestly. Um, I know it's a weird answer from an author, but I did, I started off my career, I, I produced video games for 10 years. And um, visually, um, and actually the, the, the sound on it too was amazing. The Cheshire Cat was amazing. Um, so that was good. Of course, I like Tim Burton. Um, you know, um, shoot, uh, who was the guy who wrote Vert, Jeff Noon, I want to say, didn't really love that version, but it was interesting. Um, 
Mm. Yeah, American McGee, I'd have to say. That that was my favorite um, twist. That video game was a good twist of Elf. That's a great one. I, I'll give a shout out to Heartless, but the Meyer was good. That's an origin of Queen of Hearts. Yeah. Which was very fun and nice world building, too. All right. Well, I think that's our questions. Heartless is so sad. And now I'm seeing the comments <laughs> <laughs> for the first time. No. Yes. Oh, and there's a shout out for the game you mentioned. I love that game. It was so scary to me. It was scary. It was, what's cool? That was like 97, I want to say. It was a oh, while yeah. ago. That's amazing. Well, if there are no more questions, I think we can start wrapping it up. Awesome. This is the ghost of Mysterious Galaxy <laughs> bookseller content <laughs> popping back in again then. Um, and a question that I always like to ask too, I know there's always breadcrumbs that get dropped about it during a conversation, but Liz, mm. do you want to tell us the next thing people can be looking for or what you're working on now, if you can speak about anything? Um, did I disappear? I'm sorry. I'm using my husband's setup. And oh, Am I still on there? I still, Am I still there? Yeah. Great. Okay. Then I'll just pretend that I can see you guys, which I can't right now. Um, let's see. Uh, I can't see the expression on Britt's face. So I'm, I'm going to have, I, I don't want to like, um, <laughs> There, there might be something else for the for the good folk at Disney. Um, there might be something. There might not be something. I'm not going to say more on that. Um, however, there is a also a Stuffed Two uh, sequel to Stuffed that is uh, going to be coming out from Hyperion, which is part of Disney. Um, so yeah, there's there's things coming. There's things in the pipe. Yay! People always. I know it's always funny to be celebrating a new book, but people are always so happy to get even more. They always want to ask that, so I like to always ask. No, that's great. <laughs> that's a good one. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much, Liz and Britt, for spending the evening with us and for celebrating on birthday with us. It just oh, it sounds like such a good read. And thank you to all of our readers for hanging out with us tonight and for your questions and everything. This was such a treat. Don't forget, if you would like to buy the book, we have the link also in the chat. And I believe that is it for tonight. Thank you so much to everyone. And we'll go ahead and sign off and say good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks. Thanks, Merry everyone. Birthday. Bye. Merry unbirthday. <laughs>